if everything seems under control, you're not going fast enough. On that thought, uh, welcome to our Zoom web series hosted by One Tree Hill and PMS Cart. Uh, the series is on the juggernauts where we are having conversations with uncommon and curious fund managers. Hi everyone, my name is Jai and I have today with me Karan Maheshwari who manages his family office at Maheshwari Investments. Uh, Karan is also obviously currently a director at Samsonite India and various other startups and has previously worked with McKinsey India. Uh, welcome, Karan, to our show. Thanks for having uh, me. You know, there. one of the things that we like to get started off and, you know, dive into is what we call a machine gun 15, right? Just to get those creative juices flowing and some adrenaline pumping, right? Uh, so if you're ready, I'm happy to start. Look forward to it. The market has put me in many embarrassing positions in the last Excellent. month. Excellent. Excellent. So we'll hopefully more, hear more about that as well, right? Okay. So diversification or concentration in equity? Concentration in equity. Okay. Startups, boom or bust? Tough question. Bust for the short run, boom for the long run. Okay. Uh, how would you rate the research on the street from 1 to 10? 1 being the lowest, 10 being the best. COVID times, 4. Otherwise? Maybe 6. Maybe 6. Okay. Uh, will oil go back to 0 in any contract? Unlikely. Okay. When do you think India will stop being an emerging market? I think it'll take time, you know, um, at least another five to eight years, right? I don't see us uh, stopping becoming an emerging market before then. Okay. The biggest red flags that you look for in a stock outside of corporate governance? I think today the answer would be debt uh, because you need to look at debt to equity very, very carefully. Uh, okay. So that would be the biggest answer. But I think in general, the answer would also be... Uh, outside corporate governance would probably be industry growth and how that's changed, right? So growing industry, industries that grew pre-COVID, Abata, sure. for example, past growth does not indicate future growth anymore. So okay. projecting future growth is as much a function of looking carefully at the future trends, not just the past trends. So that's you're saying point. everyone should read the mutual fund disclaimers again? Yeah, well, it's not just mutual fund disclaimers. I think this is a good time to look at the fundamentals again. And looking at it, look at them from your own practical experience and lens. So if you're not going to be buying shoes, don't believe that just because India needs more shoes and we have 1.3 billion people, shoe companies are going to do well. Right? I think okay. just think about how you would consume and that will give you a lot of insight into how consumption behavior will change. Okay, fair enough. Uh, the most difficult question on the market and which everyone's asking, are we at the bottom? I don't think we're at the bottom. I think there will be another bottom. But honestly, I don't see most people buying the market. I see most people buying stocks. So the real question okay. to ask is, are we at the bottom at quality stocks, right? Not at the market, because that's irrelevant to a lot of people because they aren't going short. Sure. Uh, the question is, and, and the answer there is probably the easy money bottom has happened, right? So are we at the bottom? For Nestle, maybe not. It could go 5-10% up and down. But do I see Nestle going back to the bottom? It was that? No. Okay. And I hope okay. that was a better. Fair enough. No. So are, are you buying right now? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Uh, which of the following balance sheet is the most stretched? The government, the corporate or the individual? So that's a good question. I think uh, to give you a straight answer on that, it would be the corporate. Right? Just because the balance sheet of the government, even though stretched, has a lot of unexpected revenue streams that they can look to tap into. Just for example, I've been hearing a lot of noise about a wealth tax okay, that they could put in. Now that just suddenly de-stresses them a little bit. There's a lot of room to maneuver in the government balance sheet. On the corporate balance sheet, and why I say corporate, is because out of 100 companies in India, there are only 20, 30, 40, maybe 100 that are really large debt-free companies. Everyone sure. else, especially the MSME sector, SME sector, pays rent and or takes borrows from the banks. And those guys have seen zero revenue for the last two months and are likely to see 30 to 40% down revenues. So I would say okay. corporate for that reason, right? Individual balance sheets, you know, individuals saving money are only at the top of the pyramid. At the bottom of the pyramid, you had no balance sheet, right? So the PNL is stretched because, you know, you're screwed. But if you didn't have many assets and they were just fixed assets, they just lay, lay the way they are. Okay. And so sort of an extension to this, do you see saving rates sort of, you know, going up again with, uh, with what you're seeing in the markets and people sort of, you know, running to safety again? 
So in the short run, yes, I think that will normalize though, because I do see people in the short run looking to save a little bit more. But I see, you know, honestly, the cutting down of expenditure happening anyways. If you look at it, you're sitting okay. at home, your costs have gone down. You're not going out to movies, restaurants, bars, clubs, flying, traveling, etc. Right? So do I see people saving money? Yes. Do I see them putting that money saved? into a bank account in FD notes? Probably not because their salaries are being cut. So therefore, as a percentage, what has happened for the first time, which is a mindset different. Huh? Lots of times what happened is the economy continued to slow down 5%, but people ran to safety. Here the economy has been hit. So people are getting paid less. So while they'll be investing less, I don't think they'll necessarily be saving more. I just think there'll be less money in their pocket. Okay, fair enough. Now you guys obviously uh, own an NVFC. So with regards to that, uh, credit expansion or credit contraction? Credit contraction. I think it's very hard to assess credit. It's very hard to understand the borrower's profile. It's very hard to understand what pressures he's under. You can look at debt and all of that, right? But when you're lending someone money, safety and risk comes first. Return comes second. Today, the difficulty is you don't know whether receivables are being paid, right? So you don't know, uh, you know, I mean, just to give you an example, you don't know whether the government of India is releasing money in 120 days, 160 days or... 600 days, right? And Government of India is the safest credit you have, right? If you, sure. say, uh, if you look at retailers, you don't know whether Future Group is going bust or not. So even if right. a retailer has a reasonably healthy balance sheet, you also don't know payables. You don't know if a, a consumer loan, right? Whether the guy is going to get a salary, salary is deferred, you don't know what his expenses are. So I don't think anyone will credit expand at this market. Okay. So the, the, the next obvious question is when do you see credit expansion? Because Compared to, let's say, China, we are obviously, in terms of ratios, uh, we are quite low. Yeah. Right? And maybe China will also contract now. But do you see at some point uh, the cycle changing? And when do you think that is? So the challenge is, and that's a macro question. I'll try and answer it in the micro because it may interest people more and then go to the macro. The challenge is, I can imagine myself lending money just now to doctors. Right? I can imagine myself lending money to testing labs, right? In, as an example, as part of an impact-based investing, we lent money to a, a, a lab that was de uh, developing testing kits, right? At a 10, 12% rate. So credit expansion happens, my point is, when you have confidence in the borrower's ability to pay out of cash flow or the borrower's asset base is liquid. The time it will happen again in this market is when I either, if I'm a housing loan company, I'm convinced that I can possess the house and sell it, or the borrower can pay back. So, from an, from, so that's the micro level comfort that anyone needs to have. So let's look at the sector a little bit. The banks will start lending when either pushed by the government or when they're, there, when they're really comfortable that the cash rich companies are even willing to borrow. Right? The NBFCs will start lending when they get money. Frankly, every NBFC is out of money. They borrowed. So first you pay off the debt. Then you get equity capital back. Then you think of starting to lend. Right? Um, and anyone else will lend money when there's liquidity in the system, right? I mean, ultimately, for an NBFC, your working capital is cash. There is no cash, I can't lend. Sure. Okay. There is an exception to this rule, though. Asset back lending, which is specifically against things like gold, will continue because gold prices are going up. And so, if I'm lending against gold, I would not stop at all because I'm fully secure, right? If I'm lending to SMEs like hospitals, like doctors, and I have a company I've invested in that's doing that. That will not stop. So I think the nature of lending will change. What was safe earlier is not safe now. Right? So, you know, an extension to that, would you sort of, you know, invest top down or bottom up right now? Bottom up. And the reason I'm saying that is because the macros are impossible to predict. I cannot predict, I could not even earlier, to be honest. But just now, I cannot predict Monday morning whether oil prices are down or up, what Trump is going to tweet about, what Modi is going to say, what Nirmala Sitaraman is going to do. Gosh. So top-down investing is good for stable times, right? In these kind of times, I can predict that, for just for example, Mahanagar gas in most scenarios is going to still have the same revenue and is going to provide gas to my house. So I can assess their balance sheet, project their revenues and invest, right? Very hard to predict the, the nifty. Sure. Okay. Fair enough. And, you know, sort of on the sort of the COVID topic, uh, will it be a catalyst for sort of, you know, ESG investing in India? It's a good question. I think the question to ask, and I'm sort of dividing this question up, is sure. will you have a bucket bath once a week? 
okay. the answer to that is yes, then just multiply that factor by 1000 and yes, it will be a catalyst for ESG. If the answer to that is no, I'm going to have the same number of shower, then, you know, honestly, ESG won't either, right? And the reason I'm saying this is bucket bath is just an extreme example. But as an individual, if you were willing to buy a diesel car because it was a bit cheaper, will you now say, no, I'll pay that 50, 80,000 extra for a petrol car? Right? If individuals are saying they're making environmentally conscious choices, or if you were earlier going to take a flight and go on a holiday and a one-stop flight was slightly cheaper or you were going to do destinations, you will cut down. If individuals become more conscious, then companies will become more conscious. Right? If they right. don't, then I honestly don't see the ESG thing in an emerging market like India becoming a big factor for the environmental and social reasons. Fair enough. So still long ITC? ITC? Yes. I am long ITC, right? Every single budget that I've watched in the last 10 years has raised the taxes on cigarettes and people have actually been uh, passing it on to consumers. So I okay. think at the valuations, I'm long ITC. I question myself on whether it's the right thing ethically to do, to buy sure. a cigarette company. But from a value perspective, absolutely. But there, so there have been a lot of uh, anecdotal information sort of floating around, uh, which says that, you know, this lockdown is actually helping people quit uh, smoking. Right, uh, because it's it's not easily available. Right, your local yeah. pan mala is, is sort of shut shop. It's generally uh, it's a it's a commodity which is difficult to procure. Yeah, my father was a smoker for forty years. Okay, he was probably the most successful quitter because he quit about a hundred and twenty times. Okay, <laughs> the test of someone who's quitted smoking right. is if they've quit for a year. So in a month, if someone hasn't had a cigarette. Guaranteed, most smokers who've smoked for over 10 to 15 years have done that month before in their lives. The question okay. is when this opens up and right. they go to socialize and they see someone else smoke, are they staying quit? I'm not sure about that. Okay. And this is just from, again, personal experience, which I use often to blend from theoretic with theoretical data on, you know, yeah. investing. Sure, sure, sure. Fair yeah. enough. Okay. Uh, moving on to sort of the, the Franklin situation. What do you make of it? Good, bad, ugly? Will it snowball into something? Wait and watch? What are your yeah. So I definitely think the credit markets will collapse a little bit, right? I definitely think this was a, uh, going to happen. Franklin happened to be the first people off the block, right? Um, the challenge is, and I don't think you can bring, blame Franklin really, right? When you're yeah. giving money, the challenge is when you're lending money out, you're expecting your principal to be protected completely, right? And, right. and you're expecting it in most scenarios to be fairly liquid. Yeah, there are certain debts that are longer duration, which are not, but in most scenarios. What Franklin is telling you is your principle is not fully protected and it certainly isn't liquid. Right? And therefore, as an investor, as a family office, and then as a corporate, and then you're saying, listen, why am I taking the risk? Right? The incremental 3, 4, 2% return over a simple cash fund or, uh, is not worth it. Therefore, the average individual, average family office, or even retail investor is saying, look, I'm out, right? I'd rather hold cash if necessary equity, otherwise gold, right? So I definitely see uh, a huge change in the way the retail investor behaves. The institutional investor will be a little bit more informed. We'll see an opportunity. We'll probably just move to safer debt, AAA debt, et cetera, et cetera. Though, I, you know, honestly, even what AAA is and is not is questionable at this point, right? Because sure. Every credit rating agency is actually looking at the past for your credit profile and not the future. I, I mean, I, and here I can be candid with you. I sit on the board of a luggage company that has huge free cash flow and been very successful in its space and we're borrowing at low rates. But at the same time, when I look at the sector, I see sales down 60, 70%. So I wonder why they're lending to us, right? Because our credit rating is excellent, but our future prospects, at least for the near duration, are not as good. Sure. So this is a problem with just following credit rating. So I would not be super optimistic as a retail investor on debt unless I'm very, very careful and very, very certain on what I'm doing. One thing that, you know, obviously, you know, you've been in the markets for, for you know, close to 15, 20 years. Um, what do you think is the, the, the mistake that keeps getting repeated by investors uh, over and over again across decades? Or something of a misconception that uh, investors have? Most people who are investors try and distrust their own judgment and listen to the experts of the time. 
I, that I see happening every single time. And I think the experts of the time are often people who have an incentive to sell a particular brand of information, right? right? The most courageous investors I've met have looked at data, but zero news, right? So they've just cleared the head of the clutter and then kind of honed in and focused in. I think the clutter and noise increases in these times and most investors, and I see this time and again, try and think the best thing to do is to get more data, more information, more noise. And that confuses them even more and leads them to make even more irrational behavior than they would otherwise. That's okay. the one thing that I would say. Sure. Okay. Uh, the next sort of question is one of the things that, you know, we've talked about for the last six, seven months. Uh, and, you know, it's obviously not an easy question to answer, but where do you see, if I had to ask you one point or one sector where you think the next innovation will come from? So innovation to me is very clear, healthcare and education, right? I think it's, uh, these are two sectors that are perennially going to be in demand. These are sectors that we've neglected in our country. These are sectors where the government's budget will increase, private sector spending will increase, insurance companies. Let's talk about healthcare, right? I mean, yeah. our country's infrastructure needs uh, investment. Our country short of doctors. Our country short of nurses. So human side needs investments and devices need investments. And now this crisis has made it clear we cannot wait. So there's no option to say, hey, let's take 10 years to do it. And, you know, you just made that clear. So what happens? Can we allocate the money that India needs? Absolutely not, right? Even if the government takes it to 3% of the budget and may puts it on par with defense, which is highly unlikely, but let's assume they do, it still cannot happen that quickly. So where do I see innovation there, right? I see a lot of startups coming and think telemedicine. So doctors that were looking at 10 patients a day are looking at 100. I see a lot of training going on in the nurse space. I see a lot of people like you and me sitting at home that can become medical professionals quickly by taking shorter courses and being authorized to deal with a host of disease. So I see capacity building happening. I see technology being used. I see India actually leapfrogging the world a little bit in okay. terms of healthcare innovation. Uh, moving on to the next one, would you double down or double up? I prefer in general in life to double up. In this crisis though, with the conviction that I have of a certain bets, I'm willing to double down. Okay. Uh, the extension to the question, I probably know your answer. Uh, but are you an optimist, pessimist, or a realist? I don't know the answer myself. But uh, <laughs> uh, my take on this is that I feel I'm an optimist. Right? Okay. I act as a realist. Okay. So if I have to tell somebody what I am, I would say I'm an optimist. Right? But in my own business, would I take a huge risk today and say India is going back with 1.3 billion, the China manufacturing is coming? No, I'd be very cautious. So I'd act as a realist. Okay. And would you fashion yourself as a contrarian investor or a trend-following investor? So I've never understood that because I often think trends of the time are only seen later. Right? So I'll give you an example. A month ago, if people were going to start buying uh, pharma, would they be trend-following? I don't know because the trend was still not pharma then. Now when you look back, everyone's done that. It's successful. So they're trend-following if they buy today. Right? I try and follow my own judgment. Often the trend is right. Very, very often contrarian investors are contrarian for the sake of being contrarian. I think it's fine to just follow your own sort of judgment. And if your judgment's the trend, then go with the trend. If your judgment's truly contrarian, then think two, three, four times before you follow it. Because there is wisdom in, in the trend, right? So if you're doing something contrarian, be clear that you're trying to see something others haven't seen. Think hard, think long, challenge yourself two, three times. And if you're convinced, absolutely done it. So I have been contrarian, but when I've been contrarian, I've thought very hard. And then I've always challenged myself to take a bigger bet. There's no point taking a small contrarian bet. That's a waste of time, right? Because that just seems like you're unsure. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so almost at the end of Machine Gun 15, but what we like to end it with is if you could, you know, go back in your sort of experience and history, and, you know, pinpoint one uh, sort of defining moment in your career, wherever it is, however it is, yeah. what would that be? I was at McKinsey and I was working with uh, Satyam. And uh, this was uh, 2008, I think, 2008 or nine. Right? And uh, Ramalingam Raju used to meet our team every couple of uh, weeks or a couple of three weeks maybe. And I remember him saying that... Uh, the, uh, the key thing, I mean, and he was one of the most impressive men I've met. 
And so one of the most defining things, I was very impressed by a detailed guy, research guy, truly committed. And I remember when the whole Satyam thing broke out, right? Just losing complete faith in three, four things. My own judgment of personality, my, uh, my ability to question how such a rational, strong guy could do such a thing. And my own ability to understand, in a, not understand what happened and what led him to that. And that, I think, changed my career because I realized very often in life how temptation and leverage and risk-taking right, can be mistakes that even very smart, balanced people, well-respected people can do. And a crook is not someone who's just bad or who's evil, right? but is someone who is you or me tempted and led astray. I think that helped me a lot later in life when I was given opportunities to do things that were slightly gray and I was able to resist them. So I'm happy to say that, you know, I still award you uh, mm -hmm. coffee with Karan Hamper. Uh, Thank you. It, should reach, it should reach you immediately after this lockdown ends. Uh, uh, not sure when that is, but sort of, you know, on the question of the lockdown, uh, where do you think the lockdown is headed? I think the government, see, there's, there's multiple lockdowns going on, right? Just now we've been told to sit at home. So we're sitting at home and we're all almost happy doing so because there's somebody who's told us, right? What's going to happen is the government will soon have to, basically for, because of the economic prospects, etc., start saying, listen, I cannot order people anymore. So they will phase the lockdown out. What does that mean? They will say that you can open up in, in zones that are not contained and then slowly in zones that are contained and they lock down buildings rather than areas and blah, blah, blah. Now, does that mean the lockdown is over? Absolutely not. All that means is the government is not imposing a lockdown. But then the decision goes to the building society, to the company, to the individual, to the elderly, to the school. So lockdowns will continue. It's just that government lockdown will probably relax the central government and the responsibility will keep going down the line. And I see that continuing for a very, very long time. You know, one of the reasons that you know, we, we wanted you to come on the show, Karan, is that we've seen that, uh, you know, advisors like me or fund managers who sort of, you know, are biased towards long only mm. have a bias, right? So it's very difficult for them uh, knowingly or unknowingly to sort of separate fact from fiction, right? Uh, you've been managing a large uh, sum of money for your family office. Uh, you know, if you could, it would really help our audience if you could say, you know, what is your thought process? in normal circumstances and in a situation that sort of we are, you know, we are facing right now, uh, whether it's asset allocation, sort of, you know, stock selection, uh, how long do you hold a stock, et cetera, as if you're running a fund person. Yeah, so it's a little different from the way you look at Jai. So the way I look at it is, uh, well, okay, so the basics that everyone talks about is risk reward, right? So. Sure. Everybody looks at the risk and the reward. Now, the challenge is when you're on a professional mindset job, you have to define what constitutes risk and what constitutes reward and stay with that definition for a fairly extended period. So a lot of professionals will say debt is low risk. Equity is high risk. Debt is low reward. Equity is high reward. And, and broadly, 90% of the time, that is correct, right? Same thing for gold, same thing for equity, right? The risk reward is predefined and then you come up with an asset allocation model. Sure. And your risk reward is often defined by if a debt item is triple A, it is low risk. If it's double A, it is higher risk, etc. I do the same thing. The only luxury that I have is I am able to put my own metrics on risk. You okay. guys put your own metric only on reward. Where you say, look, I see a 50% upside on stock. I see a 10% upside on debt. Debt is lower risk equity. So do I go with the risk reward? Where it's, but, but you take Crystal's rating as risk. You take small cap as risk. And your risk metrics are defined by external factors. Your reward metrics are what are defined by your research and your own analytics. right? And I see a lot of managers saying, do 25% of small cap and 75% of large cap and debt just based on the traditional definitions of this. Right. As a family office, the big differentiator we do is we follow our own definition of risk. So today, just to, just to give you an example, I would almost argue that corporate debt has greater risk than certain government stock equity which are paying high dividends, right? 
because I think the chances of those corporate debts defaulting is higher than Coal India not giving its dividends. Just to give you an example, right? So for me, in my low risk bucket, I'm still saying I have a low risk bucket, medium risk bucket, high risk bucket. But what is in the low risk bucket changes and it doesn't follow the traditional uh, ground. So gold could be in a high reward bucket, right? Yeah. Gold is not low risk for me because I'm only taking it for a year or two and I don't want the delivery, right? So if it's high reward, high risk, I'll still buy gold, right? Whereas a traditional asset allocator would say low risk, low reward. So therefore only buy it as a protection mechanism, not as a tactical tool. So okay. that's the difference when you're an active investor, right? You get your own definition of risk that you're able to define. Do you go wrong? Absolutely, right? You sometimes don't see the risk. Do managers go wrong? Also, yes. Like a lot of managers said credit funds are safe and they proved to be the biggest disaster, right? In fact, more people lost money in credit funds than equity, right? A yeah. lot of people said large caps are safe. And when this market fall happened, you found that high quality small caps rebounded back quicker. So I would just tell every investor that if you don't understand risk, hand over to a manager and let follow the traditional definition. If okay. you understand risk, you can make more money because of mispriced risk than you can because you understand reward. Right? Frankly, very few people are able to predict reward. Right? There's an illusion that debt gives you that you know, you know the reward that debt gives you. You don't know whether it's giving you 10%. Right? It could be zero because right. debt can be written off. Right? And you definitely don't know equity's reward because it depends on macro. So I think to be a, managing your own money, the advice I'd give everyone is just understand whether you are able to uh, quicker judge risk than the market. And if you are, then right. you're a great guy to manage your own money, right? Okay. So is concentration risky? Uh, yes, in normal times it is. Today's time, right? I'd say that if I had a portfolio of telecom, insurance, gas utilities, and little bit of FCG and pharma, probably taking less risk than a manager that's holding finance and auto and betting and waiting for yeah. a kickback, right? I may make less reward than him. I'm not arguing that he may do better in a kickback situation, but right. I don't think I'll fall as much as he will looking out from today. I think that's the differentiation. That's how I look at risk and reward. That's how I assess it. So every day, virtually, I, when I wake up in the morning, and maybe it's not every day, maybe it's every week, I encourage myself, my team, to say, what is the risk on this investment? You know, I know you guys run a, a sizable prop desk as well. Yeah. You know, there are certain uh, processes, uh, rules that you all follow per se. Yeah. Uh, my argument has always been uh, that, you know, at some point, there's always a lifespan to a particular strategy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people, investors, traders, etc. continuously need to readjust. Yeah. And even though last year has been a great year, let's assume for the time being, yes, it was. it's always prudent to keep assessing. And as you ask, what is the risk that you are running? Yeah. Have you guys been continuously adjusting or you know, do you all sort of have been running the same rules and been successful at it for the past decade? So we've been reasonably successful over the decade, but because we're not managers, the decade success doesn't matter because my clients are my family members. And if they see loss, they come to slam me immediately and they forget about all the money you made in the past or not made in the past. Right? <laughs> so, and, but that's a great question, right? So let me take that in part, right? So did we get, did we have a great year last year? Yes. Did we see a miserable February, March? Yes. We got caught with our pants down like everyone else, right? And uh, we probably got hit even harder on the crop book you mentioned because we actually had long that we built in at 11,000 or so, right? And that obviously suffered a lot. Right? Did we adjust our rules? Yes. Did we adjust them fast enough? No. We ended the year profitably. We could have probably done better. Did we stay up at night? Absolutely. There was almost a week and a half where I questioned whether I was the best guy for the job, whether I didn't see the risk. And I was very, very stressed because I lost a lot of my own money. And nothing stresses me more than losing my own money. I was a consultant for seven years. I was successful. I took my job very seriously. I saw three clients go bankrupt. But, you know, I, it worried me once in a while, but it was not my own money, right? Whether you have a thousand crores, 20,000 crores or 100 rupees, losing your own money just hurts, right? So, um, so do we adjust? Yes, we do. Are we quick enough? Depends on who you ask. You ask my family, the answer is no. You ask the broader market, the answer is probably yes, just because we can be. We can be nimble, right? We can, we're not locked in. I'm not a mutual fund manager who said multi-cap and now I can't go to small cap. I have the ability to adjust. So what have I done to adjust, right? 
in these choppy volatile markets, right? We've said that, listen, we cannot have open trade. So if you're doing any derivative oriented trade, there has to be a fixed loss set, set, whether that means buying options or otherwise. And that's a fixed sum of money that we can lose, right? We've set up a family member or an employee to be the risk officer. His only job is to say that, listen, tell me when you're doing the trade, what is the maximum value at risk? And if that maximum value at risk is hit, whatever the case may be, it may be because the market's temporary down, I'm convinced it will go up, the position is exit. You know, taking the opposite side of that, uh, over, the, over the last 15 years, whether, you know, in the private space, in the public space, or, you know, wherever else, you know, I know you do a lot of distress, solar, fintech, and a wide gamut, you know, because that's what a family office does, uh, which is one opportunity that was sort of, you know, obvious uh, to you and your investment team, uh, but most of the market missed out on? There were two that uh, I would say. Right? The first was uh, the private sort of market investment opportunity back in, say, 2012 to 14, right? Or uh, maybe a little bit after, four, maybe 14 to 16. Public markets were trading at really, really high values. Modi had just come in. Right? Okay. And it didn't make a sense to us to be investing in equities in the public markets at the time because it was a promise of what Modi would do that was driving valuations versus actual reality. Right? You had an incredible bunch of startup entrepreneurs who yeah. at the time had just come off a 2008 crisis. So people were thinking 100 times. You had VC money that was sloshing around the country right? that was looking for these entrepreneurs. As a family office, we said, look, if we have a choice and we can get in reasonably cheap and there were companies that VCs were willing to buy at almost 3x values. Uh, I'm just talking from the financial angle, three, four years later, right? Then, you know, if you're betting on the Modi story in India, this is a safer way to do it, right? Then the public markets, which everyone was saying was safer. There was more liquidity in the private markets. There was more money to be made in the private markets. There were better, more creative ideas. You were getting cheaper valuation. We absolutely did very, very well for that. 2017, that market got discovered. 2016, 17, a lot of people started coming into the market. Uh, right. By the way, on this note, if you'd ask me as a pessimist or an optimist, I'd have struggled. So because you gave me the option of a realist, I kind of stayed yeah. the right, same way. So we found that we were saying sell most of the time. So we managed to get out. Again, that was obvious to me at the time. Uh, the next sort of question is, is one of my most interesting questions. Uh, you know, back in 2004, I made, you know, some stupid leveraged uh, commodity bets, right? Uh, where I lost, you know, close to six, seven times my uh, monthly salary. And it was, you know, it was literally a knife to the chest. Uh, you know, you know, do you have uh, something that you can share with us, which is, you know, on, on similar lines where, you know, you've, you know, sat down and, you know, just sat down for three hours and, you know, said that, you know, WTF. Uh, the four week ago one was uh, I have a pot of money that I made during my time at McKinsey and by advising uh, companies abroad, which is just my personal money, nothing to do with the family. Yeah. Dollar money that was lying in a small company abroad. I've been managing the money by investing in bonds, right? I put a fairly significant amount of that money into a bond fund that was investing in emerging market sovereign bonds, right? This sounded like something I understood. There were sovereign bonds of various countries. I just felt countries would not default. A Greek default may happen, but that would be 54%. Give me good yield. I levered it up about six times, right? Okay. Uh, five, six times because you get dollar loans very, very cheap. Okay. Uh, when this crisis blew up, day one, that bond fund dropped 9%. Right? Okay. As a good investor, I said, look, governments aren't going to default. Right? I mean, I just don't see that happening. If governments default, everything else will go first. So I should sell equity. This is safe. Day two, it dropped 6%. Still a little nervous. I had the manager there calling me. That's not a pot I look at. Think we got to get out of this. Uh, Lebanon has actually defaulted on its debt. That's why it's dropped 6%. I said, okay, let's speak to the manager. The manager said, look, Lebanese bonds are priced at 30 cents to the dollar. So you've got to believe you're getting zero in every default in history. The government bonds have always been paid back and paid back 45 cents per dollar. Don't worry about it. Day three, and I'm not joking, day one, day two, day three is day one, day two, day three. The okay. oil price collapse happened and Ecuador bonds and a couple of other bonds dropped. So this fund dropped another 70 cents. So now I'm down 30% from the top in a okay. position that's 6x level. So my equity is down almost 70%. I'm also close to being margin called, right? 
I have money that I can put in, but that is not my money. It's almost like my sister's money that I've been using now. Sure. <laughs> every gut feel tells me that this is still a good hold. Okay. But every risk manager is telling me that you got to get out, right? I bit the bullet, but I still didn't bite it hard enough. I got out 30% of the position. Okay. And I said, look, I'm down 32% I'll hold. Day four, we went up to an half percent. I felt great. Day five, down 5%. No rational reason. All prices have happened. Everything's down. Everything's up day five. Uh, day one, two, three, this has followed the market. Day five, the markets are up. This fund is still down. So now I'm calling saying, what is going on? Why is the fund down? They're like, because there's a run on the fund. It's like the Franklin Temple story. There are people who are just saying we're down too much. We're margin call. We've got to get out. The fund, I mean, the fund is now, the fund manager is saying there's a 30% IRR if you hold it to, to maturity at this point, right? And even if stuff goes wrong, there's a 16% IRR. You've got to stay, you've got to stay. This is a $52 billion fund, right? $52 billion sovereign debt fund. Okay. I got out again 25% more. I still said, look, I want to hold what I did. I sold my last position on the fund down 42%, right? So okay. I, uh, the fund is down even further now, right? I'm still wondering whether I should go back in or not. Right? <laughs> Don't have the courage because sometimes you've got to write off an investment. I realized I didn't understand enough. Maybe that's retrospectively. Maybe that's in a black swan. But I didn't understand enough. And I'm, I'm supposed to be a sophisticated financial investor managing one of the largest family offices in the city. So, you know, there's no reason for me to be caught like this. I was. So that was the story that I could share with everyone. It happens to everyone. Uh, now I'm a little more comfortable. Time has passed. And, you know, I've realized that people far worse off than me. I don't know. I don't know whether it's a consolation, but it makes you feel a little better. But it's obviously important to learn from uh, what we have, what we've gone through, and uh, you know, you can learn from your kids here, right? Your son falls down every day, cries for two minutes, but his mind does. Ten times a day, gets up and is laughing the next minute. Right? The key right. is their ability to get up again. If you don't get up fast enough, you should not invest, because yep. then what will happen is you'll have one of the big losses, and then you'll sit out, and you'll miss the the rebound back, and that's the worst place to be. And then you'll get back on the horse when things are already too high. So you make an incremental money and you'll be riding the down again, right? You have to have a lot of courage and heart as an investor sure. to keep going for the duration. So we're almost at, to the end of, uh, end yeah. of this conversation. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, we end it with is that, you know, there have been a lot of fund managers, uh, you know, investors who have only started investing, let's say, in the last quarter, the last two quarters, right? And they're seeing a lot of blood on their portfolio. They're saying it bleeds, saying that, look, this is not what we signed up for. And they've also taken money from clients, uh, hopefully not with too much leverage. Uh, you know, based on your experience, what would you say is, you know, one or two messages that you'd like to tell these guys who have just started? If this is your business, which it is, if someone has just started, right, it's better to fail early than, than later. Sure. Right? Failing fast is a huge blessing because what tough times tell you is, is this for you? You're going to see 30-40% down in your portfolio if you're going to be a fund manager at least five to six times in the next 10 years. The markets have accelerated. Information flow has accelerated. Right? Brexit, demand, GST. You look at the last, yes, this is the biggest event of them all. If you look at the amount of volatility there's been, it's been rapidly increasing. Right? Then get out now. Say, I'm sorry, I've lost you money. But you know what? You can make money by doing one, two, three things. I'm happy to advise you because I feel it's my moral obligation. But you're no different than the startup who's taken some VC money and blown it. Or from the family office guy who's put in a lot of capex in a company and blown it. Right? But then you fail fast. You've got out now. You've figured out something else to do in life. Maybe it's in the investment world itself and a different thesis. Maybe it's in some other world. And you do well. If you feel that, look, I've lost a lot of people money. I'm stressed about it. But, you know, I've learned so much from it. I'm actually a better manager. Right? Then put down on paper, what have you learned? What would you do differently? Is this just bad luck? Or is this something that you could have actually done? And don't benchmark the Nifty, for God's sake. Right? The Nifty is a wrong benchmark. Right? Just look at it from people's perspective. Like the average human being doesn't really feel great because he's beaten the Nifty or bad because he's gone down from the Nifty. Only fund managers feel great or bad because it gives them some metric. Last question, we, we still have to go back to uh, the aspect that no one knows about. Yeah. I didn't want to do finance, right? I got a job with UBS uh, and Bear Stearns in the, back in the day. And I said, no, I'll go with McKinsey because I actually want to do uh, impact work. 
so even today, I, I'm an accidental financier, right? I mean, after my career at McKinsey, we sold some family assets, including companies, I got into finance, mentoring startups. It's been 10 years, right? And I question sometimes whether uh, investment should be just for return, uh, for joy and return, or because it's very addictive. Huh? Sometimes investing becomes a goal in and of itself rather than, or it should also have some impact focus. So I think for me, that's something that most people don't know because most people see me as a financier, right, whether debt or equity, and hear me talk about finance. But I'm not at heart somebody who's, I've never thought of myself as good at finance, right? I've never been a financier. I'm good at numbers and Excel and all, but I'm not a natural at this, right? I think that's helped me in my career because I've been able to take small, simple, practical, non financing angles to things. But uh, this is not something that I will be doing hopefully 10 years later. I think there's a lot more to life to do, and I want to do some of those things. And I encourage everybody in finance to do some things outside to Got keep it. a freshness of perspective. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Karan. You know, our idea has been to sort of you know get great content out there, uh, and hoping you had a great time out here as well. Absolutely enjoyed it. Made me reflect and think. I think more than anything else, it also brought out things that I didn't know about myself or remember that at some point in your life whether it's 5, 10, 20 years later people are going to ask you what were you up to in these times and you should be able to give them a great answer right? it cannot be I was sitting glued to my screen worrying about my money right? you have to be doing something in this time personally, professionally uh, even if it's money making a shitload right? that is truly a story you can tell 10 years later thanks for your time Karan thanks, Jai. thanks a lot uh, wish you a, a great 2020 you too Jai